Well, the first thing I'd like to say is thank you for taking care of Brendan and uh, being a source of encouragement to him. Uh, when a young man starts out preaching, that's a very uh, important time in his life. And how a congregation handles you when you're, you're young and you're starting out often determines whether you are still doing that 40 years later. And I don't have to tell you that we need more young men and we need more young men preaching the gospel uh, throughout this country and throughout the world. And so for, for, for a place for him to go with elders and to help him develop, further develop, you're, doing a, you're playing a very important role. In the book of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar sees this has this dream, and in this dream there's this image, and the Chaldeans and the astrologers come in, and they, they cannot interpret the dream. And, but Daniel comes in. Daniel's brought in, and Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was and its interpretation. And the interpretation goes down, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold of this image and your empire. But after you, there will be another empire, Medo-Persian Empire. Then another empire that will rule over the entire earth, Alexander's Greek Empire. Then a fourth empire, strong as iron, but there was a fragility to it. It also was mixed with clay. It would not be a cohesive empire. And then in Daniel chapter 2 and in verse 44, in the days of these kings, the kings of that last fourth empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people. That is, when Babylon was conquered, Persia basically had what Babylon had. And when Persia was conquered by the Greeks, the Greeks had what was in the two previous kingdoms. And when the Romans came along and took it all, then they kind of inherited everything and the territory, etc. But God's going to set up a kingdom that's never going to be dealt with that way that no one will ever rule it or gain control of it. And then the text says this, It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. Then at the end of the section, Daniel says, The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. You can bank on it. When John the Baptist shows up, a voice crying in the wilderness, there are two things that he says, repent. And number two is, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus would say the same thing in Mark 1.15. Jesus then told his disciples, there are some of you who are standing here, Mark 9.1, who shall not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And that kingdom arrived. The power showed up when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. Jesus linked those things together. You shall receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. You should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, the first sermon that is preached as far as with the plan of salvation built in and, a, and Jesus having died, and the people on that day said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized and be immersed, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And in verse 41, those that received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Christians were part of that kingdom. Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14 where Paul says, we've been, trans we've been translated from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 12, 28, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us serve God with reverence and godly fear, or awe, for our God is a consuming fire. As Brendan noted, we're on the road. July 12th was my last sermon in Beaverton. I was there 28 years. And Cindy and I sold our house outside of Portland. We sold probably 80% of our possessions, whittled it down to really what we wanted to keep. We got a Sprinter van, 
and we headed out across America. And we're going to seek to visit 100 churches of Christ in about two years. And I think you guys might be like number 42 thus far, and we're about nine and a half months in or getting close to 10 months in on this quest. We're looking for all the good in America. We're kind of seeing what is the state of the Lord's church across America in the 21st century. What's faith like out there? And, of course, we also want to see good friends like Brendan. Uh, we want to spend more time with our grandkids in Rhode Island. And, of course, things like we want to see the beauty of the Purple Mountain's majesty and the fruited plain and just the wonderful things are in this country. And here are things that we're seeing nine months in. Number one. The Lord's church across America is not a dying church. And maybe you've felt that or someone has told you that. I'm not seeing that. Yes, there are places where God's people have dwindled. Yes, there are places where congregations have shut their doors. But sometimes that's economic. In places like California, young couples cannot afford a starter home that's a million dollars. And so they have to go. But when they go other places, they're being part of other congregations. And as we've gone across America, we've seen a number of new works start up. And new congregations. We have seen congregations filled with young people. There was a congregation in Casey, Illinois. 130 people. 70 of them are children or young people. And they're bursting at the seams with kids. We're seeing a lot of young families And a lot of couples that are dialed in on parenting. We're seeing a number of amazing teenagers as we travel. We're hearing stories during COVID of conversions, visitors showing up, restorations. People showing up from the denominations because their denomination shut down and still may have not opened and they come in days. Our church left us. It just left us. And a church should never shut down. And we're just hearing numerous stories about that this period of time being a period of fruitful labor and fruitful season for God's people throughout much of uh, the United States. Something else. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, you have this great premise for the book of Romans I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for there's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul is, it looks like he's imprisoned again. It looks like that the first imprisonment that had, the book of Acts ends with him there, having some freedom and talking to people and teaching people. And of course, he's there in Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians and But it looks like that in the book of Philemon, he's hopeful. It looks like a release, and it looks like he is released and is able to travel for a while. But by 2 Timothy, he is back in prison again. And in verse 8, it's interesting what Paul there says, and I love the language of the verse. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. And that's something else we're seeing. We're seeing the power of the gospel as we go across America. We're we're hearing amazing conversion stories. In fact, I would say half of the people that we encounter were not raised in the church. It's not that they're in the church because, well, that's what mom and dad were, and I'm just going to blindly follow mom and dad or whatever. At least half the people that we're running into came from either nothing or the denominations. I remember one man who said, Mark, years ago I heard Roy Cogdill in Louisville preach a sermon on the one true church. And I was, I was so angry, and he was not a member of the Lord's church, I was so angry I could have bit a songbook in two. That's how angry I was. And his wife was a member of the church. And he told her, I'm going to go home and prove that guy wrong. 
And she did something really wise. She didn't complain to the elders. Eh, you know, preaching was pretty hard that night. And she didn't complain to the preacher. You need to tone it down. You can run people off. She said to him, go ahead. I'd like to see you do it. And it took him a year. He studied his Bible for a year. And finally, at the end of that year, he swallowed his pride and realized God wasn't wrong, the Bible wasn't wrong, and the preacher hadn't been wrong. He was wrong. And he was baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. Tell you what, there are a lot of stories I've heard uh, 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 that are similar to that. The first time someone heard the truth, they were angry, real angry. But that angry motivated them to pick up the Bible and open it up and see what it says. Or people that heard the truth and they were in a denomination and they went to their pastor or their priest with questions. And they got lousy answers, very unsatisfying answers. I remember one, day, one woman was a member of the Disciples of Christ Christian Church and their pastor was a woman. And, and, and she had this question like, hey, the Bible says, you know, woman is not to exercise authority over a man. And that woman said, you know what, I just think God would like us to come up with new ideas. And, and, and at that point, she said, okay, we're done. <laughs> you know, I think I'm just going to follow the Bible now. I think I'm going to start doing that. I run into a young man who grew up in New York City. His father had 28 kids. Now, I'm not sure how many women, but he's one of 28, one of 28 offspring of the same man. And his father is into voodoo and black magic. And that's what he was, that's how he grew up. And some way along the line, he runs into someone who's a member of the Lord's Church. He calls him an aunt, but he's not, she's not a biological aunt. And that woman starts bringing him, and he's a young teenager, to the Lord's church. And he says, Mark, when I met these people, I said, nobody's this nice. See, you grew up in a culture that if people are nice to you, they wanted something from you. There was an angle. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And he said, as he interacted with Christians, genuine New Testament Christians, he said, Mark, I was convinced. I said, the only way these people could be this nice is they all have to be on drugs. I mean, that's the only thing that explains how nice and good these people are. They're just all on drugs. And he finally realized what, what, what they were on was the truth. And they had bowed the knee to Jesus and were conforming themselves to Christ. That's what explained that. Today he's preaching the gospel. Years ago, 1979, I'm 20 years old. I'm working at a grocery store and I'm an idiot. Okay, I'm, I'm getting drunk every night and stuff like that. I'm living fast and hard. Cindy shows up. She's a member of the Lord's church. She's 17 and a half. And that's the only time in her life that she's ever going to be at that grocery store on that Friday and Saturday. She's like working for someone and doing a store promotion. We're having an anniversary sale. I chat with her a little bit on Friday. I chat with her more on Saturday as I leave work and say, who are you? Where do you live? And then I say, I'm coming to see you tonight. She says, okay. When I was going to get on my motorcycle and have my hair like Rod Stewart and go across America and sleep under the stars, and she was going to go off to Florida to some little college I'd never heard about and marry a preacher. And those two people met, and they had nothing in common. And that was Saturday night. And I went home after I dropped her off and came back that Saturday night and never had a touch of alcohol again. And got rid of and the stuff in my bedroom, my house, that was sinful, I got rid of that night. It went in the garbage. And by Monday night, we were getting married. No proposal, it was just understood. I was baptized less than a month later, September 18th, 1979. We were married four months later, 
over Christmas break, and she was still in high school, September 21st, 1979, and it's coming up on 42 years. And I guess what I want to tell you is that people, some of the most unlikely people like myself, that when you would have met me, you would have said, <laughs> he's going to have no interest in the gospel. That don't ignore someone like that. And that people can change overnight. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. Fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, etc. Shall not hear the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Paul's in Corinth in Acts 18.10. And God says, do not be afraid any longer. For I have many people in this city. Do not bypass the worldly person and say, well... <laughs> I mean, the Bible says to deny yourself, and I don't know if he's ever denied himself a day of his life. But often when that person hears the truth, there is good soil there. See, they just haven't found it yet. But it could be they're looking for it. I want to say something else is that when you hear the truth, do not delay. And not only that, but if you're a Christian and you encounter a non-Christian like you're a young lady and you're a Christian and there's a non-Christian man there. Let them know who you are. Don't beat around the bush. When I met Sydney, she came out, both barrels blazing. I'm a Christian, here's what I do, here's what I don't do. Don't even think about that. And, and here are my standards, and I'm, I'm not a member of the denomination, I'm a member of the church you can read about in the Bible, and sometimes we're afraid to just come out and say, this is who I am. And, and you might say, well, I think I might scare someone off. Well, if someone's a chameleon, yeah. But you want to scare the chameleon off. You want to say, here's who I am. Here's where I'm going. Here's what I believe. You still in? Because in order to get to heaven, I'm going to need somebody who's not a flake. And who's willing to do hard things. I've adopted a path of doing hard things. The right path, the narrow way. But it's a lot easier than the wide path and the broad path. I remember being at the grocery store. Exactly, by the milk cooler. It was a Wednesday. Okay. And I knew what to do to be saved. We'd had a couple Bible classes. And so I'm standing there going like, okay. Now, Mark, you could either just not do it now and wait until you're like really, really old where you don't want to have fun anymore, like 60, that old, okay? Like really old. And then you could obey the gospel. Or you could do it tonight. And I said to myself, no, if I don't do it tonight, I never will. Because after you hear, after you realize you're doomed and lost, You've cried out and asked the question, what must it be saved? And you got the right answer. You know what the right answer is. Every moment that clicks by after you know that and you don't act, the temptation has become a little bit more calloused and a little bit more calloused and it doesn't seem as urgent. No, when, when you know you're doomed and lost, and you know what to do to be saved, pull the trigger at that moment. And is it that the thrust of the book of Acts? And they were baptized the same hour of the night. Is it the thrust, the urgency? Cindy and I have been listening to some presentations on uh, preaching in India. You know, sometimes we say like, well, I don't know if I want to be baptized in front of people. Kind of, you know, I mean, there I am. Or how, how warm or how cold is that baptistry or whatever it may be? In India, basically, often you baptize people in sewage. See, there's no garbage disposal. There's no waste management in India. They got, they got no plan for their garbage. You just toss it out wherever you can find room. And so often they are baptizing people in basically what we would consider a cesspool. But you know what? When you know you're doomed, 
I need to be baptized. Whether it's a cesspool or not, I need to be baptized. They say there's another challenge when you baptize people in India. There was a man baptizing a woman there and put her down and pulled her up. Couldn't get her up. Tried to pull her up. You see, life is cheap in India, and when the man finally, with all his might, pulled the women up, he had two people. He had a corpse and the woman, because they're just dead bodies floating around in India in the rivers. You've got to watch out for that. You may immerse someone and bring up two. And the preacher just said, well, that was your, that's the old man there. <laughs> and he says, what do you do? He just said, made a biblical illustration. Is that, well, that's the old you, and this is the new you. You know, that's just, that's what you do. That's the reality. And we need to be grateful, very grateful for the country in which we live. What I'm learning also, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, God is not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Um, Rahab, Rahab is given an opportunity to save herself and her family. Boy, she needs to act fast, right? I mean, how long does Rahab have to make up her mind on what she's going to do and whether she's going to side with the God of Israel or not? She's heard. All she has is she's heard about the plagues in Egypt that happened 40 years ago and what had happened recently on the east side or on the, uh, on the east side of the Jordan. Sihon and all. She's heard about that. And she chooses God. And Lydia, and the jailer, and the 3,000 on Pentecost, and the Samaritans, and Cornelius, and Saul of Tarsus, all have their, and the eunuch, all have their moment. I've always felt that the way I heard the gospel, how it was presented to me, uh, was ideal. And I, I've thought to myself, am I only, the only one that has heard the gospel in what I would consider amazing circumstances? And as I travel across the country, and I always kind of had, maybe it was more of a theory, more of a hunch. I think the Bible bears it out. I think everyone is given their opportunity. Because I see that in Scripture. I never find in Scripture anyone who's looking for the truth that never finds it. I find people that often encounter the truth that don't buy it, like the rich young ruler. I find that. I find people that pass on it. But I always find that good and honest hearts in Scripture always find the truth. That they always are given their opportunity and often they are really good opportunities. In the book of Mark chapter 10, verse 28, the rich young ruler passes on Jesus' invitation, sell everything you have, come, follow me. And, and Jesus said, astounding, it's easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven and and Peter, it seems, kind of responds back and says, um, we've left everything. And that would be Mark 10, 28. And Jesus will respond and say, as surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brothers, sisters, mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. You, you have a family here, but you've got a family out there that you've never met. And that family stretches from the Pacific to the Atlantic and beyond. It's the family of God, and it's a big family. Back in 2017, Cindy went on a road trip, 57 days, 11,300 miles across America, just doing the borders, and various Christian women joined her. Sisters in Christ would fly in and join her for certain legs of that trip. And they needed hotel rooms only two nights. Can you travel across America from the Pacific or way up in Washington, and can you travel all the way down to Key West 
and stay with Christians all along the way? And the answer is, yes, you can. That's the family you have out there. And you got a lot of family. In the book of Revelation, it says in chapter 7, he sees a great multitude on Mount Zion all dressed in white. Sometimes, and I know when we, I was in Oregon for most of my life, and there's not a lot of churches in Oregon. And sometimes you think things are, we've only got very few brethren out there. And the reality is you've got a lot more brethren than you realize all across this country and across the world that you've never met. You will meet them one day. And Cindy and myself are having the privilege of meeting a lot of them, a number of them now in this life as well. You've got a big family out there. And they're doing a lot of things. And they're very active. Sometimes, and you don't hear about it because each congregation of the Lord's church is autonomous. That's the Bible pattern. The elders are told in 1 Peter 5, tend the flock of God among you. They don't tend the flock. They tend the flock they're members of. And we don't really have any newspaper that tells everyone about all the baptisms that are going on, but chances are someone is baptized in the Christ every day of the year, somewhere. And it's not on the news because 99.9% .9 of what happens in the world today is not talked about the news because they don't have enough time to talk about that. And typically what they talk about is not the planes that landed, but the planes that crashed, <laughs> right? right? And because that's just kind of what catches people's attention. But realize that there, there's a lot going on beneath the surface of the Lord's people that you do not ever hear about. But you get to see it when you travel. And we've had this great privilege of traveling. And one of those is in James chapter 1 and verse 27, where it talks about pure and undefiled religion. And among that is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But also there's something there where it says, in chapter 1 of James and verse 27, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble or affliction to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Virtually every congregation Cindy and I have attended, someone there has adopted children. And in many cases, there are multiple families there that have adopted children. And I want to tell you that the Lord's people, members of the Church of Christ, throughout this country are on the front lines of people taking care of orphans. I mean, some of you have heard about sacred selections, and they're just, you know, a nonprofit that individual members of the church formed to help families adopt children and to help with expenses for adoption or to place children in homes. And there was a fundraiser in the hill country of Texas that raised over $250,000. And that's just individual members of the church and that's giving on top of what they give on the first day of the week. And so I have very little patience when people say that God's people are not generous. I also have very little patience with people that say that those of us that are viewed in non-institutional groups are not taking care of orphans. And there's a lot of people out there adopting children. In KC, Illinois, there was the preacher that was holding the meeting there. They adopted three children, and each one of those children had different forms of dwarfism. There was another family there that was foster parents. They had a little girl. She was three, but she's always going to be like a newborn baby because of the condition she has. Children with the condition that she has typically don't live past three, but her birthday was back in the fall. And you don't really know how much she is aware of. She's just like a little newborn baby as far as the noises that she makes. But this family is going through the expense of adopting her. And you go like, why? Why would you do that? Because 
This little girl may never know that those people are her parents in this life. Why would you do? Why would you go through that expense? Because they want her to belong to them. Because it's the right thing to do. There's another girl in the congregation who is three. And your typical three-year-old. And when this three-year-old comes up to this other girl that, you know, you don't know how much she is aware of, the little three-year-old comes up and just roughs her up lovingly and pats her and says, hey, baby. And all of a sudden, that little girl lights up and is aware of that girl's presence. And it's just a good lesson that we need to treat everyone with respect because we're all made in God's image and everyone has value. And it's the Lord's people that are out there doing that. There's a, in India, there was a man from the Cedar Park congregation who went to India and who was trying to find the Lord's church in a particular, in a town of like 8 million people. And nothing's in English. And he sees a guy in a pink shirt and a tie walking, and he asks the guy, do you know where the Church of Christ is here? And he says, well, yeah, I'm going, I'm preaching there today. I'm not from here. I'm from hours away, but I'm preaching there. Well, the man's name was Billy. And years ago, Billy's, I think, dad or grandfather left a lucrative job with the Baptist church when he heard the truth. And he gave that all up, and he took his money, and as an individual, he started a, a place to feed orphans. And there's an, unlimited, there's an unlimited number of orphans in India because life is cheap. He also built a church for lepers because you have brethren who are lepers in India. You have brethren who are lepers in India. It denies that leprosy exists, but it does. And there are, there's, a church that are, that there's a church composed of lepers in India who are all members of the Lord's church, and they're your brethren. And also as individuals are training preachers. And when this man in Texas heard about it, he comes back, tells the Christians there about it, a number of Christians go to India, check it out for themselves, make sure it's legit, and then say, okay, what would you need to feed 500 lepers, or 500 orphans? What would it cost? And consider it taken care of. And that's people, and they formed a nonprofit just to do that as individuals out of their own pocket. Right by the place where the orphans were, there was a, a, a brothel, a place of prostitution. And the lady that ran it would throw trinkets across the fence to try to lure the young girls over to her and say, see, see what you can, if you come over here and be part of us, see, that's evil. I mean, that's pure evil. And so the wrath of God comforts me. I don't have a problem with hell when I hear stories like that. And what's hunting that woman is not asleep and is not, and it's going to show up. But what, what the members of the church did is they bought that house. <laughs> they bought it and got that woman out of there and then started using it for good purposes. They just said, we can't. That's not acceptable. That's not acceptable. And so God's people are doing a lot out there when it comes to the orphan. And there are, what, there are modern day Daniels out there. There are modern day Josephs that are members of the church out there. That, that's not all heroes of the past. The preacher over there was somewhere and he heard her voices coming from a car and he got in there and he threw a blanket off and there were kids that were being drugged and sex trafficked and things like that. And he called the police and he called people together and they rescued those children from the mafia. There are people there putting their lives on the line. And when you hear stories like that, you kind of go like, are we getting soft? 
do. I need to be doing something with my life. I'm watch, am I watching a little bit too much TV? <laughs> am I playing too many video games? When there are people doing heroic things. There, there's, a, there's a job out there for me. It's a big one. And I like what someone said. Go out there and pick up the heaviest thing you can find and lift it and go through life and do something hard. And have a great story. And do as much for the kingdom as you can. You know, people often ask us, Mark, Cindy, what have, what have you seen? What have you seen? What's, what, what's the amazing thing that you've seen? And yeah, we've seen some beautiful scenery like the Redwoods, but the most amazing thing on this planet is not the scenery. It's not the planet. It's the people. What shall a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, which means that the soul of one individual here, like just the soul of one of these kids, is worth more than all the buildings and stuff in Tucson. I mean, what's the value of all the property, buildings, houses, cars, and stuff just in the city of Tucson? What's that number? Trillions or beyond that? What's that monetary number? If everything was wiped out, what's the economic loss? The soul of one individual is worth far more than that, and then just multiply it about anything on the pl- everything on the planet. And are we acting upon that? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And then in Isaiah chapter 2, as we kind of wrap, wrap up tonight's talk, and I really appreciate you being here tonight, it encourages me, and just to get to know you and know that, hey, we're part of family. You're my mother and brother and sister. You're part of my family. Because, you see, I do not have any family members on my side of the family that are members of the Lord's church. And they're pretty much all gone. Mom's gone. Dad's gone. All my aunts and uncles are gone. I got two brothers left, but they're not, two te- they're not New Testament Christians. And I met. And so having family is very important to me because I don't have any family. I don't have any family members that I can talk to about the Bible, about God, about... And if you have that, value it. If you have parents that are Christians, then you can say, Mom, Dad, I got a Bible question. That's priceless. Because there's a number of people in Lord's Church don't have that. You know, I mean, there's, there's a number of people that talk about when I die, I can't wait to meet my mom and dad. There's a number of us that don't have that hope. Man, don't take that for granted if you got a mom and dad or the faithful. Tell them thank you <laughs> for that. Thank you for being faithful, because I don't have to worry about you. And I can look forward to seeing you. And therefore, live in such a way that you will see them. And you will be all together one day again. Isaiah 2 has often been paralleled verse 2, rightly so. It shall come to pass in the latter days, verse 2, and in Acts 2, verse 16 and 17, as Peter begins his sermon, he, he quotes Joel, Joel's prophecy. And Joel's prophecy had said, and it shall be in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house, and in the New Testament, the Lord's house is the church, 1 Timothy 3.15 shall be established on top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And the Great Commission is going to all the world. And in Acts 2, you have Jews from every nation under heaven there on Pentecost. And in Acts 10, the gospel starts going to all the nations with the conversion of Cornelius' household. And by the time you reach the end of the book of Acts, the gospel, as Paul writes in the Colossian letter, has been preached in every nation under heaven, at least you might say, in the then world of the Roman Empire, Colossians 1.23. And then it says, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways. We shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. Not of Moses, but the law of Christ, the new law, the new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31. 
and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. When Peter got up with the other apostles and started preaching in Acts 2, what was going forth was the word of the Lord. And it all started in Jerusalem. And so that parallel is very correct. Then he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. Shall be, they shall beat their swords in the plowshares, their spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And many people right there feel, well, but that's future. That's some utopia. That's not happening now. And that's wrong. That is happening now. It's been happening since Pentecost. You see, verse 4 was never meant to be this thing that was universal where some sort of utopian peace just shows up on the world. Verse 4 is talking about what happens to the people that have the attitude that go up to the Lord's house and say, let's go and learn about God. Let's allow God to teach us His ways. And as a result, let's walk in His paths. Sometimes, sometimes maybe you're somewhere and you're going like, I don't know. Sometimes maybe I don't see verse 4 among God's people. And what I'm telling you, it is. What I'm telling you is that 2,000 years later in North America, 2,000 years later in Tucson, Arizona, Isaiah 2-4 exists. Because there's a group of people that came from the world, like myself, and hopefully this describes me, that took our sword and laid it down and bowed the knee to Jesus and sought peace with God and peace with their fellow man and said, I'm going to start building a constructive life. And I'm going to be a new person and a new creature. I'm going to be a saint, a Christian. And I'm going to conform my life to Jesus Christ. And the people that do that are the new nation, the new family, the new temple. And they're composed of Jews and Gentiles. People that were once children of wrath, Ephesians 2. People that were far from God and alienated from God and did not have God and had no hope. And now they're all part of the same family. And they have peace with God, and they have peace with each other. What if you turned on everything in you that needs to be turned on? That God talks about. Compassion, courage, faith, patience, goodness, meekness, self-control. What if you flipped every switch? And one of you with single-minded endeavor sought to become the best version of yourself that you could ever become. And that was your single-minded aim and goal. And to not waste any of your talent or opportunity or potential and just see what type of person could I become if I just followed God single-mindedly and sought to be all that he wanted me to be, and abandoned every excuse I ever had, I can't do that, I can't do that, and just said, well, I'm going to try. I think that would be worth finding out. And I think that would make a great story. Whatever you pick, pick what's going to be true a thousand years from now. I think in picking the Bible, we pick that. Pick, that's going to, pick something that's going to work for you, not just today, but tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20, 30, etc. And the gospel is that. And then pick what is going to benefit you and everyone around you. And that's the gospel. And that's Christianity. If everyone embraced Christianity, we would not need to lock our door tonight. And we would have plenty of money for every single need on the face of the earth. And every social problem that the world has would pretty much disappear 
overnight. I think that says something about its validity and truthfulness. I enjoyed speaking with you tonight. Just remember that time is still there. We're still alive. And the plan of salvation remains the same. And you've got the answer. To your neighbor, relatives, coworkers who are not Christians and are going through a lot, you've got the answers. And don't remain quiet.